Hi there, it's Suzanne from BMO. Welcome to our third BMO Bite study session for the MS900. The last study session covered Module 2, Core Microsoft 365 Services and Concepts, and we covered the first two objectives, Productivity and Collaboration Solutions in Microsoft 365. Today, we're going to cover the second half of Module 2, which covers Endpoint Modernization, Management, and Deployment Options. And then another objective is Analytics Capabilities. Sounds pretty technical, I know, but this isn't a deep dive. Remember, it's a fundamentals exam, so we won't get too technical here. By now, you must be exhausted from studying, but remember that understanding these capabilities will help you drive value for your customers. So module two, describe core Microsoft 365 services and concepts. We covered the productivity solutions objective in the last webinar the collaboration solutions. And now we're going to move on. I'm going to go over this second and this first. So we're gonna start with the analytic capabilities in Microsoft 365. Then we're gonna to backtrack to the endpoint modernization management concepts and deployment options. So if you're following the MS Learn, MS 900 modules, under the objective for analytic capabilities. These clearly define what you need to know. And if you don't have access to the admin portal, go ahead and set up a sandbox on Microsoft Learn. They give you instructions. There is an interactive tutorial, which definitely walk through that if you don't have access so that you can visualize the report capabilities. And the questions on the exam mostly centered around where do you find the report. So you do need to understand the reports that are available in the Admin Center. Best way to do that is to be able to fish around. Here I'm logged into the Admin Center on my demo tenant. And as you can see, reports is here. High level, the adoption score, and the usage reports. Most of the questions focused on the usage reports. And this has changed so if you've been in the admin center before, I think they have productivity score or something. But I don't remember any questions on adoption score, but um, adoption score is broken into people experiences and technology experiences, and they're benchmarked against peers, which are organizations similar to yours. And just be vaguely familiar with the different areas that it tracks for adoption score. Meetings, content, collaboration, teamwork, mobility, network connectivity, endpoint analytics. And then it does provide actions for recommended actions so that you can increase your adoption score. I will say that this interactive, I do believe, is using the older reporting interface, but the base reports are all the same. It's just they've organized them differently onto cards, and I'll show you. So back to reports, and we went over adoption score. Usage reports, the bulk of the questions came from usage reports. And it is important to know this, that the reports Increments are 7 days, 30, 90, and 180. And here's a list of the how the reports are structured. So it might be a good idea to at least know Office 365 Exchange. All of them have usage reports and activity reports. But I know there were several questions on the Exchange reports. And we'll just go ahead with the quiz and the first question is an exchange report. What report would you view in the Microsoft 365 Admin Center to see the level of meeting activity in users' mailboxes? Now this one's a little bit specific, but if you've been in the report, you should be familiar with the columns that are available. And look at the keywords, don't get too caught up. Look at the keywords activity, right? So you have meeting activity. 
if you're going to map that to an answer, email activity report is probably your answer, but I will show you. So I think in the interactive tutorial, they had cards for all these that were set out here. Now the navigation's on the left. But you get the overview report where you can see active users. Exchange is what we're looking at, right? And we know there's three, email activity, email app usage, mailbox usage. Know the difference between the three, what type of information is in them. So we're looking for meeting activity. So we want to know maybe how many meetings they were involved in, how many they scheduled, how many they were invited to. And as you can see, meeting created actions. And you do have to scroll over to see. And then meeting interacted actions. So here would be the email activity report and it does record meeting actions. Obviously, email activities, send mail, receive mail, read mail. And then also know in the reports, I used to find this very handy because I needed more information. You can choose the columns. So if you're missing a column, you might want to go over there and check. And also you're able to export reports so you can get a spreadsheet. And that's pretty handy because then you can use Excel to filter for information. So real quick, we'll just go into the other one so you can see it. So we know the answer is email activity, but We'll go into email app usage. This one, we don't have any data on. I think I open, here we go. So this report looks like this. Again, remember this, 730, 90, 180. Okay. And I have a question on this later, but you can see that you can see the versions of Outlook that they're using. And then you can also see which apps, like Outlook for Windows, Outlook for Mac, Exchange Online. So you can see how your users are connecting to Exchange. And then here's an example of the columns that you can view. So it is nice to see if you were trying to determine if users are using legacy protocols and applications. And mailbox usage basically deals with storage quotas. You can put quotas on their mailboxes so that they don't exceed a certain amount of storage. So we know the answer here is email activity report. Next question, you need to know how users are connecting to Exchange Online. What report would you use? So I gave you the answer if you were listening. We know how they're connecting. That's what applications they're using. So that's your email app usage report, which I don't have in my admin console, but that's what it looks like. And then finally, which report would provide you the number of users that access SharePoint on a particular day. So on the overview tab, now they pull in the active users report, but you can see that it monitors all the services and the number of active users for those particular services and SharePoint's one of those and applications. So you can definitely visualize that. So endpoint analytics is part of the adoption score now, but I don't believe they asked anything concerning where it's located, but you need to understand what is endpoint analytics. And obviously endpoints are the devices that are accessing your services and they can help you identify policies and hardware issues that might be slowing devices down and help you make improvements proactively. Your devices need to be enrolled in to Intune in order to be able to see the endpoint analytics report. And we're gonna go over Intune in a little bit. So I will show you what the endpoint analytics looks like. 
And then the other choice was activations report. And again, I, I, those are included under Office 365. And there's your activations. And this is where you can see which, how many product licenses are assigned and the users that activated them. So this would be good to check to see if you need to purchase more licenses. So again, get in here and dig around so that you're familiar with all the reporting tools for all the different services and applications. For example, SharePoint. The nice thing about this report is you can see where file sharing is occurring. So we determined that this was active users. Okay, quiz number seven, we're gonna go ahead and continue on with analytics. First question, will center around Viva? And we should probably just have a quick review of Viva because if you haven't been in the Viva suite, it might be a little confusing. There might be some overlap. So let's just make a high level overview so you are familiar with which product is what in the suite. So we know the Viva suite is an employee experience platform. And then they break it down into four experience areas. So connection, insight, purpose, and growth. Those are not the products, even though insights is a product, they break it down in these four areas, then the products will be listed under them. So keep Viva Connections and Viva Engage. Very similar to an intranet. Connections is mostly a one-way communication. It's the gateway to the employee experience. Kind of like a homepage for employees to find information that they need quickly. And then Viva Engage is more of a two-way communication that has the social layer with Yammer service running behind it. And for the area of Insight, the only product they have right now is Viva Insights. For Purpose, they have Viva Goals, which is goal setting, AKR, OKR management. And then for growth, they have Viva Learning and Viva Topics. Viva Topics delivers knowledge, uses AI, and then Viva Learning is a centralized learning hub. You can connect to SharePoint, connects to Microsoft Learning, LinkedIn Learning, and other third-party courseware. And then finally, Viva Sales, which links to your CRM. So we're going to talk about Viva Insights because we are discussing analytics and Viva Insights provides analytics on employee well-being. So I would definitely know that the insights are privacy protected and particularly when it talks about personal insights. Personal insights can be delivered to your inbox. You get a notification, and here's what we're looking at. It uses quantitative and qualitative data to empower individuals, managers, and organizational leaders. So we do know personal managers and it says organizations, probably leaders would have been a better choice, but we know those three are the answer. And these other three options, or other two options, are not the answers. This one can be confusing, teammates, and I'll show you why. It seems if you know too much about the subject, you can easily get confused. But if you go into the Viva Insights page, you can see that 
there are personal insights and manager and leader insights. And the manager insights is where you can see insights into how your team is working, but you do not see individual teammate information. And it is kind of confusing because they say teamwork habits, but that's just how much time they're spending in meetings after hours. Are they spending a lot of time online after hours? But it's not about individuals. So personal managers, organizations, or leaders. Enough about Viva. You should be an expert by now. Now we're going to move on to the reports and other admin centers. As an admin, where can you view information about security trends and track the protection status of your identities, data, devices, app, and infrastructure? Here is the Learn module that discusses the reports and other centers. These are the different centers, and then I will take you into them so you can get a visual. Again, if you have a sandbox that you opened, you can go to admin.microsoft.com, and then you can view all the different admin centers You'll use the credentials, use it in private window to go in and use the credentials that are provided to you with the sandbox. So going on our keyword play, we're going to remember that security will equal Microsoft Defender. Okay, it says security trends and track the protection status of your identities, data, devices, app, and infrastructure. There you go. We found the answer that quick. Let's view the other admin centers so we understand what they are. Remember, compliance will equal Microsoft Purview, okay? And that's where you can view status and trends for the compliance of the same thing, devices, data, identity, apps, and infrastructure, okay? Endpoint manager, that think Endpoints are the devices that you're managing, right? So that would be Microsoft Intune, Azure Active Directory, Think Identities, right? So if they ask you a question about, you want to see the sign-in logs, right? That's where you'd be looking, Azure Active Directory reports. Exchange, you should know this by now, that is email flow, right? That's where you, you can do transport rules. And you can even view logs of the actual emails that are flowing through. SharePoint. That's your shared document repository. And we will go into the center so you can see, but one of the things here that's important to note is if you're an admin, you want to be monitoring if your employees are oversharing and you can see how many files and which files are being shared externally. And finally, Teams Admin Center. There's a lot you can do in the Teams Admin Center. And we'll take a quick look at that as well. Okay, and there might have been a question about what you can do in the Microsoft Admin Center. So a basic familiarity. You can see the other admin centers are listed at the bottom. So these should look familiar. We already mentioned them. Straight from the admin center up here, just make sure you understand that you can add users, delete users, you can reset passwords in here, select a user, reset their password, set up multi-factor authentication. You can set up groups, okay, shared mailboxes, assign roles. This is rooms and equipment resources for scheduling and billing. So there were a few questions about billing and I think I think that will be covered in module four when we talk about licensing, but this is where you would go. There's a lot of questions about where would you go to assign licenses, you know, so, and payment methods. There was a couple questions on that. Support. There are some questions on support. Again, that will be module four, the customer lockbox, 
and service requests. I do know there was information on service requests. And then we did reports and health. There, This one is pretty important. Again, service health. This is where you receive announcements about the health of your service. So if you're suspicious, you're having problems with Intune, for example, configuration policy is getting pushed out. And you're like, what is going on? You can look in here. And when Microsoft identifies there's an, a problem with a service, they will actually log it here as a case. And then you can look at the history and you can give product feedback here. You can also give feedback within the applications themselves as a user. Okay, let's move into the different admin centers. We're going to start with security. This is what the question was about. So we know security will equal, guess it, Defender, right. So security will equal Defender. We're just not going to go deep into everything in here just because that will come in the next module. But know that Defender, you know, the main purpose, what you're going to manage, and it's security across identities, data, devices, apps, and infrastructure. So this is a common theme when we get into compliance. It will be managing compliance across identities, data, devices, apps, and infrastructure. Okay, we'll move on to the next one, compliance. So now you know compliance is, guess it, purview, right? Compliance is purview portal. Again, we just said this, compliance needs, you manage your compliance needs here, protect sensitive info, manage data cycles, reduce insider risk, and safeguard personal data. Again, we'll go into that more in the security module. Endpoint manager. Endpoint is in tune, plus other things that they have on-premise infrastructure. You can see your configuration manager co-management in here. That think endpoint, that's your devices. And take special note in here, the platforms. So the following can be enrolled into Intune. Windows, obviously, iOS, iPad, Mac OS, Android. This is in preview and Linux. Linux was recent, so on the test I did have a question, which devices that you could manage, and the choices were these four. Okay, exchange, that would be everything about mailboxes. And I want you to take note that all of these admin centers have their own report sections. Some of them kind of overlap a bit, but. And next up is SharePoint. And you can see all your active sites, collaboration, integration with Teams. And they do say in Microsoft Learn, they, they stress the whole sharing in the report so that you can see if external sharing is on the site. And there is. In Data Access Governance, a sharing links report. So you can prevent oversharing. Monitor your sites. That might be a question. And finally, the Teams Admin Center. Pretty powerful admin center here. Focuses entirely around Teams. 
and it's broken into, the good part is you already had some training in our first part webinar on the features of Teams. So this should look familiar. It focuses on the Teams devices, the apps, meetings, messages, and voice, which would be the Teams phone. And there's reports in here as well. Reports in every admin module. Usage reports related to Teams. So that's your quick and dirty on the admin center. And there are additional admin centers. And again, remember that depending on what licenses you purchased, you will see different things or you'll see it. And when you go into it, you don't have access to it or you have no reports on it because you don't have um, that feature enabled. And I got to say an oops here. I did skip over Azure Active Directory, which is really important. Again, depending on what type of license you have, you have different access. And notice now it's going to Entra, so it's getting integrated into the Entra label. And I think in here, basically the question that I had was, as far as reporting and analytics goes, it's where would you go to find user login information? So login, sign-in logs would all be located under the users. And you can view the logs, what they signed into, where they came from. And there's also audit logs. where management actions are audited and logged. Azure Active Directory handles the identities. So kind of equate that with identities. There's a lot more to it, but again, this fundamentals and just know the high level. So we're gonna finish up module two with the last objective. We just did analytic capabilities in the last two quizzes, and we are gonna move on to endpoint modernization, management concepts, and deployment options. Quiz eight, we're going to touch on endpoint management and deployment options, endpoint management, the devices that are connecting to your organization. We're gonna show the portal, how you manage those, and how do you get things out to them? How do you deploy Windows? How do you deploy applications? So we're going to touch high level on some of these items. We will start with the first question, which of the following allows you to pre-configure devices, automatically join them to Azure Active Directory, and customize the out-of-box experience? And the choices, Windows Autopilot, Configuration Manager, Tenant Attach. These will all be listed in the same page when you're studying it on Microsoft Learn. And we're going to go through that. So when we look this up in Microsoft Learn, they don't really have any visuals for you, which I wish they did. But it's this objective, the describe the endpoint management capabilities. These are all listed individually. So... Intune, Configuration Manager, Co-Management, Tenant Attach, Endpoint Analytics, Windows Autopilot, Azure Active Directory. I would highly suggest on this page that if you have not been in or have experienced Endpoint Manager, I would suggest going through this interactive. Or if you set up a sandbox, you should go in there and move around a little and see what is available in there. It will help out conceptually. So we'll just go right to the answer and then I'm going to show you a visual, two different visuals. But Windows Autopilot, that is the only product that sets up and pre-configures new devices, getting them ready for use. Here's a visual of the Autopilot process. It's not super technically detailed, but all you need to know is the basics. 
So Windows Autopilot uses the OEM optimized version of the Windows client. And it's pre-installed on the device. So you don't have to maintain the custom images and drivers for every device model. And if you've ever done this on an on-premise environment, you would know it's a full-time job trying to keep those images updated if you have a lot of different devices. So instead of re-imaging the device, your existing Windows installation can be transformed into a business-ready state. And that state can be achieved by apply, applying settings and policies that are automatically configured in Endpoint Manager, install apps, change the edition of Windows being used. They can go from Pro to Enterprise, for example. So users would receive a new inbox device directly from the OEM or reseller partner. And it could be a repurposed device as well. They simply take it out of the box and they log in. And Autopilot automatically installs the apps and settings that your IT admin configures. And configuration and setup can be done from anywhere. And IT never has to touch the device. So this is where you hear that term zero touch. And that's exactly what it means. Instead of maintaining images and handling devices, IT just sets them up in Microsoft Intune as the apps and settings. And then partners can register devices with Autopilot on the user's behalf. Once employees turn on their new device, Autopilot can set them up anywhere there's an internet connection available. And there's only a few simple steps required. Their new device is ready in minutes after that. And that includes applying all the user device and app policies that IT pre-configured. For example, they may want to enable BitLocker, so they create a policy for that, and the device then is secure from the very start. And it's important for you to understand and communicate the benefits of Autopilot to customers. It's avail available with Business Premium, F1, F3, all the A licenses, E3 or E5. And so the benefits are it frees up IT hours, and we talked about why. They don't have to manually configure images and keep them updated. And they also don't have to walk the employees through a lengthy setup process. You don't have to spend two hours on the phone talking them through it. They just turn it on, put in their ID, answer a few questions, and there you go. Second benefit would be that it improves employee satisfaction. They can be up and ready in minutes. And if there's a problem device, a problem with their device later, once it's in that steady state usage, that's where that break, fix, or reset comes in. If it's something that can't be solved quickly, IT can remotely reset the device. And then we're back to the ready for business state and all the policies applied updates and they're back to steady state. At BMO, we use Autopilot. When I started with BMO, they shipped me one in the box. I opened it up, signed in, just let the updates run, walked away, came back, and I was ready to work. And again, last week, one of my colleagues had an issue with hers laptops, and she was back in action in a couple hours. They reset her device, and she was ready to work. So we're not going to go into the details of how to set up Autopilot, but I'm just going to show you for the visual where it is in Endpoint Manager. Under Devices. And then Device Enrollment. And here's where you see all the automatic enrollment, co-management we talked about with hybrid. And then here is the whole autopilot deployment program. And once they're all registered, you would be able to see the devices in here. So once the devices are enrolled into autopilot, and you can enroll devices in, they didn't have to be the new out of the box, you can do that with profiles, then you should be able to go in 
to the device. And then you would be able to do an autopilot reset. So that's what we were talking about. If there was a problem, that's that break fix scenario. The IT could remotely autopilot reset it and it will go back to its business ready state. So that was a lot of talk about autopilot, but I think it's pretty important to understand what it does and how it benefits customers. So the answer here was autopilot. And configuration manager we know is the on-premise solution. It's the on-premise version of Intune, kind of. And then tenant attach is where you actually connect the configuration manager and Intune. So the answer is autopilot. Okay, the next question, true or false, the ability to run Windows as a virtual desktop describes Windows as a service. And we're gonna get into the next discussion, which we'll cover through the next quiz to Windows as a service. But for now, this one's a little tricky because you think it's Windows as a virtual desktop, so it's Windows as a service, but it's not. Virtual desktop would be desktop as a service. So instead of your desktop being local to your machine, the desktop is on a virtual machine, so it's serving your desktop as a service. So the answer is false. And the next question. So this is gonna get us into a big discussion on servicing channels and deployment. So in this objective, I'm pointing out in Microsoft Learn the, the order that they're going through. We're basically going to cover the deployment and release models for Windows as a service, so that's deploying Windows. And then there's separate deployment methods and update channels for Microsoft 365 apps, the applications. So the question that we just had was concerning applications. So just be clear when you read the question, are they talking about Windows or are they talking about the apps? So our question was about update channels for the apps. So I think understanding deploy versus servicing is very important. And deploy, try to think of how are you going to get it out to them? So we're talking about the apps. How are you going to get those out to them, the devices? So. These are the choices they give you, and this one with Configuration Manager, you can deploy from a local source. So you would manage that entire deployment in the Configuration Manager. There's an Office Deployment tool, tool and that tool can be used, configured to download from the Office CDN or from a local source. So you can save the deployment files on your network. And then finally, just a self-install from the cloud. Self-install from the cloud would require your users to click from the Office portal, say there's a button there to download the desktop apps. So let's talk about update channels. So it's like, what is the frequency of updates? Okay, so you can select whether they're getting them from a current channel monthly enterprise or semi-enterprise. So let's take a look at the admin center and see how we would initially deploy the Microsoft 365 apps. And then you can also see the servicing channels within that. And when you deploy, there's different ways of deploying the apps and there's also different ways of them receiving updates. So I'm just going to show you in tune what this looks like. And once you've deployed them in Intune, the clients automatically use the Office CDN to receive updates out of the box. You don't have to do anything else. And we're gonna create a profile for this. So now you can see I wanna deploy the Microsoft 365 apps, Windows 10 and later. Notice you can create one for Mac OS as well. 
And I'm just going to go ahead. If I wanted to put it in the company portal, I would select yes, but we're good there. Okay, now this is where I wanted to show you. Here's where you actually can say what you want to include. You could take out Skype. Maybe you don't want them to have access. You could take those out. And then right here, remove other versions. So if they already had another version that came like pre-installed on their computer, you could have it remove that. And this update channel, there it is. So here's where you can see the update channels. And it's a little more than they give you in the documentation. I showed you they had current monthly enterprise and semi-annual enterprise. But they also have these previews. I don't know if you'll get a question on those, but it would be good to know they're available and what they'd be used for. So I'm going to hop on over to show you that. So here's a great chart that compares. Remember, we're talking about the Microsoft 365 apps, not Windows updates. <clears throat> And it compares the three. So just be familiar with the release frequency and what they recommend for use. Because they might give you a scenario. They want to do this. What would you, which channel would you use? So our quiz question was the monthly enterprise channel. Because the scenario was you want to provide them with new features once a month or on a predictable schedule. <clears throat> Note that the semi-annual would be for things that you want to do extensive testing before they receive the new features. And they give an example, regulatory government or other organizational requirements, and they get the feature updates twice a year in January and July on the second Tuesday of the month, which is Patch Tuesday. Also, monthly enterprise is once a month on the second Tuesday of the month, and current is as soon as they... They are ready usually once a month, but not on a set schedule. So you wonder, oh, if I put them on semi-enterprise, annual enterprise, they won't get security updates. Security updates can, would actually push through once a month on the second Tuesday of the month for all the channels. Okay, so let's talk about this preview channel that we saw. So right there current channel preview and semi-annual channel preview. So we'll start with semi-annual. The feature updates are twice a year in January and July. So if you're on that channel, that's when you'll get your feature updates. Now, let's go to preview of the semi-annual. There it is. And notice here that the preview we said January and July for the non-preview. So you would be March and September for semi-annual preview. And that would give you four months before the regular semi-annual enterprise channel would get it. Now you're like, wait, it's later. But I think September, October, November, December, January, you'll be ahead of the September you would get the January release early. And again, it gives you the scenario. You should deploy the preview of the semi-annual enterprise to a small representative samples in your sample of users in your organization to help you identify any possible issues before those features are more broadly released. So that's the point of preview. There is no preview for monthly enterprise. But there was a preview for the current channel. There it is. And we'll wipe this out. So here, there isn't a set re release schedule for the current channel preview. But you can get the new features at least a week before the current channel. Because current channel, you get them as they're released. So a week before, if you're on current channel preview, you would get those. And again, small sample of people to help you identify any issues, but you'd only have a week before you knew. 
And then something I found by doing this, <laughs> I was not aware of, you could actually go to config.office.com and it says this is the recommended for enterprise customers. This is the recommended update and deployment tool for the apps. So there you would have an inventory of your devices and you'd create these servicing profiles. So anyway, good to know. And just to review again, we did say it, but how to deliver the updates, here were the options. And this servicing profiles was the one I just said I had discovered myself. And we showed you, you can deploy and in tune and they get automatic updates. And if you're on premise, right, we learned that you can use configuration manager. You can use network shares to store, download the files, store it and deploy. And then you can combine, combine cloud and on-premise locations for updates in a hybrid using Configuration Manager. So just understand high level what you can use to deploy the updates. Last quiz, quiz nine, and that will wrap up this module. Okay, we're kind of hopping back to virtual desktops again, but it's all part of this objective. This question, I actually had something similar on my exam. Which of the following solutions can provide a virtual desktop used by multiple users using FS Logic technology? So keywords here are virtual desktop, multiple users, and whatever this FS Logic says. We'll find out. So back to the MS 900 study in MS Learn. Again, I'm going to show you the list and that would fall under. Compare the differences of Windows 365 and AVD. I didn't have any questions about Windows 365. It was all AVD, but I'm sure they're going to have questions about it upcoming in the next release of the test since it was a new product. So now I am sure that there'll be questions. The fact that the objective asks you to compare the differences, that's what you need to do. So again, repeating desktop as a service would be Windows 365 and AVD as your virtual desktop. So the first word, virtual desktop, both of those are virtual desktops. So that doesn't narrow it down for us. The next one can be used by multiple users. Let's see. Well, they clearly say Windows 365 is dedicated to a single user. Ha! So we're going to roll Windows 365 out right away. But let's just look further. So I'm going to scroll down to, oops, let me get rid of that. Okay. AVD. And we can see, you can set up a multi-session. Multi-user virtual scenarios. Okay, and the last keyword was FS Logics, and over here, dedicated to a single user or used by multiple users using FS Logics technology. That's all they mentioned, but it does have to do with managing the profiles, so the multiple profiles. I actually had a question about FS Logics. So we know our answer is. Azure, Azure Virtual Desktop, AVD, not Windows 365. Windows is a service that isn't really a viable option. We know that Windows as a service is um, the deployment, update, and servicing of the operating system. And we're going to be talking about that next some more. And we know it's not the M365 apps, so... We've got our answer. So do take note of the note that is on the AVD versus Windows 365 page. And it states that 
on a Surface device that is running virtual desktop that the lines are blurred between the local desktop experience and the virtual desktop. And then the important thing to remember here is touch pen ink and biometric authentication. So that could be fingerprint or facial recognition. They span both the physical and virtual environments. So that could be a question. So I just want to add to this a little bit, not to complicate it, but just to clarify. When would you use one over the other? This is useful to understand, particularly in sales, when your clients are requesting which solution would best suit them. Just remember that simplicity is the Windows 365, and it's, we already said, personalized desktop, single users. And I think this is important, the predictable per user pricing versus AVD, where you can have the multi-user sessions. And it's optimized for flexibility. So it is more scalable. Now with more scalability also sometimes requires more complexity in far as administration goes. And then it has consumption-based pricing. And we learned that about Azure a lot. It's billed based on consumption, not a predictable monthly bill. Okay, we're going to move into Windows as a Service deployment and release models. The question is, a company has a Windows device that performs a single function, does not have an internet connection, and the device operating system only needs manual feature updates once every three years. What update servicing channel would be most appropriate for the device? I actually had two questions pertaining to long-term servicing channel on my exam. I don't know if that was luck of the draw or unluck of the draw, but we're gonna quickly go through the different deployment and servicing models. For the servicing, there are release types, right? You have feature updates or you have quality updates. Feature updates are those twice a year, like the 21H1, 21H2. Even though they say they're smaller, they do take a while to update. I'm not sure how small, but smaller to what it used to be. So like when you went from Windows 7 to Windows 8.1, that was a major update. Now feature updates replace that with smaller changes so it impacts the users less. Quality updates provide security and reliability fixes and they're issued once a month. So now we're gonna talk about servicing channels and this will answer the question that we have. And these are Windows updates that we're talking about. So there's three, Windows Insider Program, GA or General Availability and Long-Term Servicing Channel. So Windows, Windows Insider is when things are still in development the features that will be coming in the next feature update. And Microsoft recommends that your organization have maybe a few devices enrolled in this so that you can actually start testing those features prior to release. General availability receives the new functionality with feature updates releases annually. And long-term servicing is designed for things like medical equipment or ATMs. They might they're not running office apps or edge or anything, and they may not have a persistent internet connection and they don't need updated that often because they're just performing one, one function. And generally they would be replaced before, possibly before they need updated. So these devices generally go on this long-term service channel and feature updates on those are only available once every two or three years. So our answer is long-term servicing channel. And our next question, your, coming, your company wants to control when departments receive Windows feature releases and quality updates on their computers that run Windows 10 and 11 Enterprise. Which Windows as a service option would you configure to facilitate the update schedules required? 
So here we need to talk about deployment rings. And we are talking about update schedules, right? By department. We want different departments to receive updates at different times. So this gets kind of confusing, but deployment rings basically separate the devices into deployment timelines, and then you can assign let me scroll up here, servicing channels to the rings. And then once you've assigned them to the rings, then you can further control the timeline. You can delay, defer it for deployment. So here's an example. Notice, and again, I feel like this is confusing the way they write this, but a common ring structure uses three deployment groups. So you could have your own deployment groups. This is just a common structure that companies use. So a preview deployment group, so your preview deployment ring would probably use the Windows Insider Program servicing channel, right? So you would create this deployment ring and assign it this service channel. I'm gonna show you how this looks so it makes more sense. Limited would have been for pilot and validation. So in this case, limited, you would probably want the general availability channel assigned. And then you could not, you don't use deferral in this case. So as soon as it comes out for general availability, they get it, no deferral. And then finally is broad for wide deployment. So in this case, um, we've had time to make sure it works properly on all the devices across the network, the sample devices, and now you're ready to broadly deploy it. So again, then you would be picking the general availability channel and you would apply a deferral time to it, to that deployment ring. And then finally, that it did answer the question, it will be build deployment rings by department. Also in this section, it's important to know deployment methods. How are they going to get the updates? So we have modern deployment methods, dynamic, and traditional. We know what Windows Autopilot is because we went over that in depth. So Windows Autopilot is a modern deployment method in place upgrade is just simple automated that uses a Windows installation program to up, upgrade from an earlier version. And the nice part about this is it automatically preserves the user data. It happens in place with the least amount of IT effort. And you have subs for dynamic, you have subscription activation. And you can think of that as when you switch editions. In this case, they said Windows 10 Pro to Enterprise. AAD join with automatic MDM enrollment. And provisioning package configuration. And that uses women, Windows Imaging and Configuration Designer. And then we have traditional deployment methods. That's a new computer. <laughs> computer refresh or computer replace. So we have the answer to this and then I'm going to go ahead and show you what that looks like. Okay, we're going to see what that looks like in Endpoint Manager. So we're going to Devices and these would be Windows devices. And we're going to look at this update rings for Windows 10 and later. So these are your deployment rings. We have a sample one here. And it's nice because you can see the profile assignment status in here. Here we can see what we're allowed to do with the update rings. So, you know, are you going to allow Microsoft product updates? How about drivers? Do you want to allow driver updates? And then here's those deferral periods we were talking about. So if you created different deployment rings, right, you want to 
assign, in the case that we said maybe we wanted a preview, a limited, and a broad. So the limited, we might assign the GA servicing channel, but we don't want a delay. So as soon as it comes out for general availability, no delay, push it out to the users in the skirt. Or maybe we want to have a broad deployment ring where we pick the general availability channel, but we're going to uh, defer the update for a while to make sure that our limited users ring have it fully tested and checked out, and then we're ready to go for general availability on the broad ring. And so here you can see this servicing channel. So we know the three servicing channels are GA, Windows Insider, and long-term servicing channel. And you can even set the active hours when it installs it, when it restarts it, if the users are allowed to pause the updates, check for them on their own, and if there's a deadline to when it needs installed. And of course, you have to assign it to groups. So in the case of that question, then you may be assigning this deployment ring to the department. Thank you for joining me today. Stay tuned for the next webinar where we will tackle the dreaded security, compliance, privacy, and trust in Microsoft 365. Remember to follow me on LinkedIn to keep in on the know for our upcoming study sessions. Thank you.